Chapter 12 covers the diversity of life. This chapter only has two sections, 12.1, Organizing Life on Earth, and the second covers how we determine evolutionary relationships. Although these two organisms obviously look very, very different from one another, they're actually distantly related. All life on Earth evolved from a single common ancestor. Biologists map how organisms are related to one another by constructing phylogenetic trees, which is what you see here. It's more commonly known as the tree of life, and it shows us how we're all related. Notice that everything comes from a single branching point, and we have three different domains of life that are diverging from that point and then branching themselves repeatedly. The little ends of these points show us organisms that have evolved more recently compared to those that are closer to that original diverging point. So when we talk about organizing life on Earth, we're looking at phylogenies. And phylogenies are evolutionary histories that show us the relationship among species or even groups of species. When we create these relationships, or rather figure them out, we're uh, looking at the study of science known as systematics. There are actually a lot of disciplines in biology that contribute to the creation of the tree of life, but if that's kind of the sole goal of your study, we say that you're working in systematic biology. Information given to those working in systematics includes fossils, different studies on morphology or what you look like, or anatomy, which is the kind of perfect structure of your body parts, and even um, your molecular information, your DNA or your protein chains. We're continuously finding new species on Earth and actually new information about older species when we find new ways to study things. Taxonomy is the scientific process of naming and grouping species. Everyone across the world works in the same internationally shared classification system. And this allows us to not have to use you know, seven names when we're talking about the exact same animal. It makes writing and reading papers a whole lot easier. It was built off of the Linnaean system. There was a scientist named Carl Linnaeus. He was a Swedish naturalist who kind of came up with this idea of using a hierarchical, hierarchical, quite the word, <laughs> model. So once you get down to like the lowest rung of the ladder, you find a single species. And then as you move up the ladder, there are bigger um, nested groups. So we have really inclusive groups where we look at um, organism, as long as you have these really basic characteristics, you belong in that group. And then we have really exclusive, exclusive groups where you have to have a whole list of characteristics to belong in that group. We've actually looked at these before, even if you don't remember it, back in chapter one, because we said that everything is split into three large domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. That would be a really um, inclusive group because everybody fits in one of three groups and that's kind of saying something. Within each domain, we split organisms into kingdoms. Kingdoms are broken down into phylums, classes, orders, families, genuses, and species, and even in some instance, subspecies. Unlike taxonomic classification, Phylogenetic trees are a little bit easier to read because you can look at them um, like a map and kind of see a whole bunch of information at once. There are a, a few important things to kind of realize when you're looking at these phylogenetic trees. They were built by looking at shared characteristics. So individuals who are closer to one another share more of those generalized characteristics. When you have the splits in the lines, we refer to those as branching points, and that represents an evolutionary event where one species split into two or more species. Nowadays, we try to make sure that all of our trees are rooted, which means that they branch from a single common ancestor representing um, where all of these individual species came from. Some other important things to note, I remember being a little lost. So when you see the Eastern Lowland Gorilla and the Western Gorilla, we refer to those as sister taxa, and that's because they branched out from kind of a single lineage point. You can kind of see how they separate. 
a little funny, uh, or it looks a little funny the way that they come off that line. And that just means that those two particular species have split from one another with the mountain gorilla. So that's an instance of three species coming from one previous ancestor. So the trees can get pretty intricate and actually pretty interesting. Other trees are kind of made like yes, no decision trees. If you've ever looked at a decision tree, there are a lot of them online. They're usually conical. Um, <laughs> these can be a little bit easier to understand than your basic phylogenetic trees because it shows you how certain species are split off and what characteristics they have. So in this instance, the common ancestor that we're looking at um, kind of starts, it almost kind of starts with the lancelet down there on the bottom. You can see um, a non, an animal that was an invertebrate. So lancelets, they are actually branched off because they have um, all of the characteristics to be considered a vertebrate. We're going to get in, I realize that's really vague. We'll get into that in some later chapters. But you start building kind of more complex creatures because your first kind of branching point says hinged jaw. So do you have a vertebral column but not a hinged jaw? You're probably a lamprey. Everyone above the lamprey, they all have a hinged jaw. But kind of the next added specialization is legs. Do you have a vertebral column, a hinged jaw, but no legs? Good chance you're a fish. Frogs have a vertebral column, a hinged jaw, a hinged jaw, legs, and um, they're lacking an amnion, which is a wrapping around their eggs. So when you get up to lizards, they have the vertebral column, the hinged jaw, the legs, eggs with the amnion, but they're missing hair, which is what separates them from the rabbits, or in this instance, it would be easier for that to say mammals. But you can kind of see how these trees work. So same generalized information. They look a little busier because we include more text in them, but they can be slightly easier to follow. So how do we determine these evolutionary relationships? We have to be really careful because we need to consider organisms that share physical features and similar genetic sequences. Because if you share both of those things, you tend to be more closely related than organisms that only share common physical features. When you have you know, your leg overlaps in morphology and in genetics with a creature that's not a member of your same species but awful similar to you, we refer to those as homologous structures. An example of a homologous structure, as previously mentioned, would be bird and bat wings, the forelimb of a horse, the flipper of a whale, and the arm of a human. Because not only do they share morphology, they share what they look like, you can see the similar bone structure, but they also share the same genetic sequence dictating that the creation of that structure. Appearances can be a little misleading. For some people outwardly, they think we look very, very different from chimps, yet we share 99% of our genome. Environment can really shape bodies into vastly different ways, as you saw on that last slide, with relatively few changes to the genetic code. And that's why we need to ensure that when we are inferring evolutionary relationships, we're using more than one source of data. When a character is similar, um, similar in look, but not similar in genetics. That tends to come from adaptive convergence, or if you remember, convergent evolution. So these two different creatures developed a, a same trait or the similar trait because it's evolutionary advantageous, but they didn't necessarily develop it together or develop it or develop from a common ancestor that, that also had that trait. So an example here, insect wings, bat wings, and bird wings, these are considered analia structure. So they're really similar, um, but they don't have the same background. Molecular systematics helps us to make some of these connections with a little more certainty than before. So molecular systematics uses information on the molecular level, including DNA sequencing and protein sequencing. It's helped us do a few things. It's helped us to confirm some of our earlier assumptions, and we have actually had to admit some error. Scientists make error all the time. So we are uncovering uh, some misconceptions and correcting what we used to think. So when we look at molecular characteristics, usually what we're focusing on are the amino acid sequences of a protein, uh, differences on the individual nucleotide level of a gene, and then how genes as a whole are rearranged relative to one another, relative to their neighbors. The 
general assumption is that the more similar two sequences of genes are in organisms, the more likely uh, the more likely that it's that they're more closely related. The important thing to note is that different genes can actually change at different rates, and we have to kind of take that into effect when we consider our analysis. There are some genes that aren't as important to the older overall health of an of an organism so they can evolve relatively rapidly without like a huge deleterious effect those are really helpful when determining relationships among closely related species because they can change really fast species to species and that's okay it can actually be helpful to differentiate between you know different types of uh, birds living on an island some sequences however are vital to the survival of an organism. So they can't really evolve very fast because if you alter their function just a little bit, you might alter kind of the livelihood of an organism uh, surviving. You can't do that and pass that gene on. So that helps us to determine relationships between distantly related species because it's not going to change over time, even if some of those other, you know, more kind of phenotypically sensitive genes are changing. Comparing phylogenetic trees using different sequences. So I compared, you know, your DNA to the DNA of seven other hominids, and then I compared your DNA to the protein sequences of seven other hominids, and then I looked at your um, gene relationships compared to seven other hominids. And we're going to look at the overlap and say maybe all of our organisms are organized the exact same way on two trees and there's just a little bit of difference on tree number three, we're going to go with all of the overlaps and kind of infer relationships again using a lot of data points. We just don't want to, to throw this stuff out there because we think that, you know, in one tree it looks great. So scientists are very, very, very careful when they're building these phylogenetic trees. You can see again the way that these trees can be built when you look at this picture. So what this picture is showing you is something called cladistics. Cladistics is the using of clades to build a phylogenetic tree. So we group you together in a clade or a group of like, like organisms dependent on a very important feature of your physiology, a very important feature of why you exist the way that you do or why you have babies the way that you do or, you know, some big kind of hallmark flashing red light characteristic of your physical self. So we've mentioned this before, but in the case of amniota or having a sac, <coughs> excuse me, having a sac around your children, a protective sac around your children, it's actually a, a novel characteristic. Not a lot of groups have that. So when they built a clade, they built a clade around having that birthing sac either inside of an egg or just wrapped around the baby itself as a specialized clade. Having a vertebrae, having a backbone is also a very big characteristic that ties a lot of animals together. So we have one big clade, everyone who has a vertebrae, and then there's actually a smaller clade within it, everyone who has an amnio. And grouping things by these clades helps us to build phylogenies, helps us to build the tree of life. There are three big assumptions when it comes to cladistics that you might have picked up on on that previous slide. The first assumption is that living things are related by descent from a common ancestor. So that is, we are already there as we talk about evolution. The second assumption is that speciation um, splits one species into two, never more than two at a time. Not everyone um, kind of follows that idea. As I mentioned before, we saw the monkeys that split into three different groups. But you can kind of accept this simplification in the creation of a basic clade and then make it fancier later. The third assumption is that traits change enough over time to be considered a different state. So what do I mean by considered a different state? So that means that you can kind of place the states in order from simplistic to more evolved or more advanced. So the assumption was that an amniotic egg developed later as a different character state than a non-amniotic egg. So it's the assumption that having an amnion makes a difference and kind of separates your group out from others. 
So in cladistics, we look a lot about, or we look a lot at in groups and out groups. So in in groups, that's a group of taxa where everyone is being studied and analyzed together. Out groups, those are all the species that are outside of that taxa. They diverged before whomever it is that you are studying. By comparing your in-group members to one another and your out-group members to one another, we can kind of look and see what evolutionary modification should be considered when we look at speciation events. We can look at shared ancestral characters and then shared derived characters. So if you have a shared ancestral character, it's found in everybody that's in your in-group. The shared derived characters are only seen in you, and that's kind of what makes you special. So as we consider all of these different character states and all these different traits, how on earth do we make a final decision? That's pretty basic. We go for the simplest explanation. It's, um, it's called maximum parsimony. So we try to group things to where the least amount of evolutionary change had to happen, the least kind of major major effects underwent that organism because we want to can we want to kind of simplify this process because we know that evolutionary change can take a lot of time and it can take a lot of large events so we shoot for the simplest explanation and as with most things in life that's usually the one that's true that's the end of this chapter it wasn't terribly long so um, you should read the chapter for yourself take notes check out a lot of resources and attempt your homework